have enough uh, sand trucks left. And it's the ice. And then you couple it with people in Washington don't know how to drive. <laughs> That's the worst part. I left very early. I was out shoveling snow at 4.30 this morning. Leave the door open.
assumes that we get 4% real economic growth each quarter over the next few years, 14 quarters ahead of us. Find it out. Might have tightened you up a little. Well, well, listen, we know how grueling your training has been, but you're an inspiration to our young people that they can reach the top by striving for excellence. And America will be cheering you again on the downhill, and the best of very, uh, the very best of luck to you. And now I wonder if uh, your running mate there, uh, Christine Cooper, is at hand. Well, bless you. All right. Christine, listen, I want to tell you, all of us I've just been saying to Debbie, we're all very thrilled back here. We know the painful injury that you had to overcome, and believe me, a lot of people were holding their breath when you went around those gates on your way to the silk. Well, it certainly was, and your silver medal uh, I think under all the circumstances, you're a real profile and courage. Spending, we have more than cut in half the increase over the projected uh, Carter defense budget. Much more than half has been cut, and the increase since we've been here has only been about $3 billion a year over what he himself had proposed then. And he was down in his spending, he was down to 5% of gross national product for defense spending. In the 1960s, defense spending was 10% of gross national product. It was 9 per, or 8% in the 1970s. And by 1979, it brought it down to 5%. And we are holding it to 7%. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you were getting laughs. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Happy birthday to you. How old are you? And two days early. Aren't they Happy coming birthday. fast enough without moving it up? Hold the candle out. Make a wish. Mm. You should you should know what I'm wishing. It's easy enough to guess, sir. It's easy enough to guess. Now, now. See, you don't have to share that little one. Look what's there. It's from Tip O'Neill. It's got football bladders in it. Blown up. They no, it's explode. Not. It's from me. No, I said the cake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says, I love you, and it says, What more can I say? Happy birthday. And then it says, Guess who? But she already just gave it away. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening. Please be seated. I have a, a statement here. We've been pleased to see mounting evidence of new strength in our economy by following policies of lower taxes and free and fair trade. America has led the world with 33 straight months of growth and more than 8 million new jobs. Inflation has been held under 4 percent. and Meanwhile, nations clinging to high taxes and protectionist policies have not only failed to match our performance, they've lost jobs and seen their investment flow to the United States. Opportunity is our engine of progress, so I'm asking Congress to work with me and not against me to control federal spending, to pass our fair share tax plan, lowering rates further, open up closed markets overseas, and urge other nations to cut their high tax rates to strengthen their economies and ability to buy American products. We've begun doing many good things for America these last four and a half years. Much remains to be done and can be done. 
So let us not place all that progress, all our hopes for the future, at risk by starting down a slippery slope of impulsive acts and imprudent judgment. This is a time for cool heads and clear vision. And now my vision says that I should call on you, Helen. President, as you head toward the summit, uh, one of the big questions is whether you would be willing to explore the possibility of a trade-off on, on the space weapons uh, for big cuts in the Soviet arsenal, and I'd like to follow up. Helen, no, this is, we're talking about the Strategic Defense Initiative now. I'm sorry that anyone ever used the Appalachian Star Wars for it, because it isn't that. It is purely to see if we can find a defensive weapon so that we can get rid of the idea that our deterrence should be the threat of retaliation, whether from the Russians toward us or us toward them, of the slaughter of millions of people by way of nuclear weapons. And rather than that kind of negotiation, I think at this summit meeting, what we should take up is the matter of turning toward defensive weapons as an alternative uh, to this just plain naked nuclear threat of uh, each side saying we can blow up the other. And this, I would hope that if such a weapon proves practical, that then we can realistically eliminate these horrible offensive weapons, nuclear weapons, uh, entirely. And I also have to point out that with regard to whether that would be a bargaining chip, which I don't see it as that at all, is the fact that the Soviet Union is already ahead of us in this same uh, kind of research. They have been doing it much longer than us, seeking a, a defensive weapon also. Some individuals that uh, haven't learned the lesson and, or haven't lived long enough to have been around when uh, uh, the Great Depression was on. That's one of the advantages of being a kid my age. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Helen, I'm sorry. You think the rose could be the national flower? <laughs> Does the rose by any other name smell so sweet? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd planned to speak to you tonight to report on the State of the Union. But the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, but overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes. Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista Mikulov. We mourn their loss as a nation together. To the families of the seven, we cannot bear, as you do, the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. 
belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program, and what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. I want to add that I wish I could talk to every man and woman who works for NASA or who worked on this mission and tell them your dedication and professionalism have moved and impressed us for decades, and we know of your anguish. We share it. There's a coincidence today. On this day, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake died aboard ship off the coast of Panama. In his lifetime, the great frontiers were the oceans, and a historian later said he lived by the sea, died on it, and was buried in it. Well, today, we can say of the Challenger crew, their dedication was, like Drake's, complete. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. My fellow Americans, thank you for joining Nancy and me on this festive evening. The menorah stands lighted in Lafayette Park, for this is also the time of Hanukkah, and this season is rich in the meaning of our Judeo-Christian tradition. In a moment, we'll be lighting the national Christmas tree, carrying forward what is now a 62-year tradition, first begun by Calvin Coolidge. Tonight, we're drawn in warmth to one another as we reflect upon the deeply holy meaning of the miracle we shall soon celebrate. We know that Mary and Joseph reached the stable in Bethlehem sometime after sunset. We do not know the exact moment the Christ child was born, only what we would have seen if we'd been standing there as we stand here now. Suddenly, a star from heaven shining in our eyes shining with brilliant beauty across the skies, a star pointing toward eternity in the night, like a great ring of pure and endless light. And then all was calm and all was bright. And as we light this magnificent tree, may all the youthful hope and joy of America light up the heavens and make the angels sing. Merry Christmas and God bless you all. And now, we are going to light the tree. gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan.
Jimmy, do you see my gun show? Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem of the Soviet Union and the United States of America. Surprises. Have you brought a surprise for President Reagan concerning the arms negotiations? Well, I don't think that policies are made with surprises. Responsible policies, particularly by countries such as the Soviet Union and the United States, have to be well thought over. And on the basis of that, responsible decisions have to be taken. Я предлагаю эти ручки Last на память взять. Можем даже обменяться.
of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy and I welcome you tonight to this dinner in honor of Prime Minister Thatcher of the United Kingdom. In 1952, when Winston Churchill had become Prime Minister for the second time, and all the troubles of the Cold War, including the hardships of rearming the West, were keenly felt, he was having a meeting with a group of American journalists in New York. In Martin Gilbert's extraordinary biography, we find recorded these words from Churchill by his doctor, Lord Moran. What other nation in history, when it became supremely powerful, has had no thought of territorial aggrandizement, no ambition but to use its resources for the good of the world? I marvel at America's altruism, her sublime disinterestedness. All at once I realized, Lord Moran went on, Winston was in tears. His eyes were red. His voice faltered. He was deeply moved. Well, Prime Minister Thatcher, I think you can imagine how humbling it is for an American to read such an account, such a tribute from Sir Winston, a man so unselfish himself in pursuit of the cause of freedom, a man who led Britain when Britain stood bravely and unselfishly alone, is only a reminder of how deeply runs the mutual admiration on both sides of the Atlantic. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand to join me in expressing admiration and appreciation for Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and in raising a toast to Her Majesty the Queen.
Let us not only recall Dr. King, but rededicate ourselves to the commandments he believed in and sought to live every day. Thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And I just have to believe that all of us, if all of us, young and old, Republicans and Democrats, do all we can to live up to those commandments, then we will see the day when Dr. King's dream comes true. And in his words, all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Thank you, God bless you, and I will sign it. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States, the Secretary of the Treasury, James A. Baker III, and the Chief of, the S Chief of Staff to the President, Donald T. Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Please be seated. Well, thank you and welcome to the White House. In a moment, I'll be sitting at that desk, taking up a pen and signing the most sweeping overhaul of tax code in our nation's history. To all of you here today who've worked so long and hard to see this day come, my thanks and the thanks of a nation go out to you. The journey's been long and many said we'd never make it to the end. But as usual, the pessimists left one thing out, out of their calculations, the American people. They haven't made this the freest country and the mightiest economic force on this planet by shrinking from challenges. They never gave up, and after almost three years of commitment and hard work, one headline in the Washington Post told the whole story. The impossible became the inevitable and the dream of America's fair share tax plan became a reality. When I sign this bill into law, America will have the lowest marginal tax rates and the most modern tax code among major industrialized nations, one that encourages risk-taking, innovation, and that old American spirit of enterprise. I feel like we've just played the World Series of tax reform, and the American people won.
come. Mr. President! 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 M
Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, distinguished members of the House and Senate, when we first met here seven years ago, many of us for the first time, it was with the hope of beginning something new for America. We meet here tonight in this historic chamber to continue that work. If anyone expects just a proud recitation of the accomplishments of my administration, I say let's leave that to history. We're not finished yet. So, my message to you tonight is, put on your work shoes, we're still on the job. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, I will say to you tonight what I've said before, and will continue to say. The budget process has broken down. It needs a drastic overhaul. <laughs> with, with each ensuing year, the spectacle before the American people is the same as it was this Christmas. Budget deadlines delayed or missed completely. Monstrous, continuing resolutions that pack hundreds of billions of dollars worth of spending into one bill, and a federal government on the brink of default. I know I'm echoing what you here in the Congress have said because you suffered so directly. But let's recall that in seven years of 91 appropriations, bills scheduled to arrive on my desk by a certain date only 10 made it on time. Last year, of the 13 appropriations bills due by October 1st, none of them made it. Instead, we had four continuing resolutions lasting 41 days, then 36 days, and two days, and three days, respectively. And then along came these behemoths. This, this. This is the conference report, a 1,053 pages report weighing 14 pounds. <laughs> then this, a reconciliation bill, six months late. That was 1,186 pages long, weighing 15 pounds. And the long-term continuing resolution <laughs> This one was two months late, 
and it's 1,057 pages long, weighing 14 pounds. <laughs> now, that was a total of 43 pounds of paper and ink. You had three hours, yes, three hours to consider each. And it took 300 people in my Office of Management and Budget just to read the bill so the government wouldn't shut down. Congress shouldn't send another one of these. And if you do, I will not sign it. <laughs> let's let's change all this. I'm gonna do this. Wherever you like, Mr. President. We're gonna we're gonna arm wrestle. Okay. Well, as you know, I'm really going to beat you. You know that. I think you are. 60, 61 years close to. Okay. Okay. You want, you want the left hand or the right arm? Okay. When I say three, you go. Ready? Go. Go on. Oh. 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 You're I don't right. believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I want a re I want a rematch. Yeah, okay. Come on. Okay, this is because you took a dive that time. I didn't take no dive. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> I don't believe it. You're a great man. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My fellow Americans, this has been a busy and eventful week for Nancy and me. Now that the summit in Geneva is behind us, we need to look ahead and ask, where do we go from here? As I told Congress, we've made a fresh start in U.S.-Soviet relations. Every issue was on the table, and our 15 hours of discussions were tough and lively throughout. I got a better perspective from listening to General Secretary Gorbachev, and I think he went home with a lot to think about, too. I plan to meet Mr. Gorbachev again next year in Washington, but between now and then, we have much work to do. Opportunities to address important problems of Soviet-American relations should not be squandered. We must always be realistic about our deep and abiding differences, but we should be working for progress wherever possible. On arms control, the Soviets, after several years of resisting talks, have now agreed that each side should cut nuclear arms by 50% in appropriate categories. And in our joint statement, we called for early progress on this, directing the emphasis of the talks toward what has been the chief U.S. goal all along, deep, equitable, fully verifiable reductions in offensive weapons. Again, it's wonderful to be home. So until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you.
patient with the leadership has been fully supportive of Congress. I, I think we're on the brink of a good, good agreement. Uh, it, it's not the last word, as, as you have already said, that we will ever speak on the matter of deficit control, but I think it, uh, it's worthwhile, and I think Bob Dole and others will have other suggestions in the future on how to proceed. But this is, I think, a good, sound undertaking. It's worthy of bipartisan support. I hope you feel so, and that we can go forward with it. I agree with every word how it's going to be. Thank you, sir. Exactly that way. Uh -huh. I want to compliment Tom Foley and all the others who participated. They worked considerably hard, long, and it was very arduous, arduous and tortured, but they did they with it. Uh, Tom Foley does a superb job always. This is another example of that. I think we've got a lot of work to do.